Broke ass media in full effect. Broke ass media. Drew Pearson, original 88. Oh. Takes the snap. Bumps and watch. He's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch at the five. Touchdown. Pearson goes in for the touchdown. They and the Cowboys score. And they did it like this. Heartache on Drew Pearson's face and in his voice after he endured hearing the 15 names of new members of the NFL Hall of Fame. His wasn't one of them. We thought we were going to have a good moment. That's all I think you need to do. We deserve that moment. We can't do nothing about it. Can't catch no more damn passes. Can't run no more routes. Adding to the agony was the crowd of reporters and supporters who were surrounding Pearson, expecting a different outcome. It's when they say you don't deserve it, they talk negative about you. There's nothing negative about my career. In the NFL. Nothing. Step right up here, brother. Right there. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I'm going to cry. Come on. Second year. What do you think, Drew? Oh, my God. I brother, you're not here to, to tell me hi. Uh, listen, uh, I remember last year all too well. Oh, my God. When I had to call you and you were so heart sick yes. and I was heart sick. And I, can, why don't you take off your mask now if it's all right? Okay. Okay. Oh, and uh, with the help of two guys who love you, and on behalf of all those fans who love the game, yeah. uh, on behalf of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, on behalf of the 226, just like Jerry and Roger, that are now having bronze bust in Canton, Ohio, I want to thank you, Drew, for all you've done for the game. For all you do for the game now and all you're going to do for the game. Oh, my God. Thank and you. I want to welcome you to Canton, Ohio, which will be uh, your home for the rest of time. God. And I want to promise you that just like Jerry, just like Roger, yeah. we're going to keep your legacy alive forever there. Right, the guy you. that has my job 100 Dave Bakers from now <laughs> is going to be talking about Jerry Jones and Roger Stoutback and Drew Pearson not only as great contributors to the game, yeah. but as the man of character that you are as well. Well, thank you. I thank you for saying that, and I'm just stunned. I didn't know what to expect coming here. Not this, though. <laughs> and I've been waiting, you know, finding out the vote had been in and all that, and I'm going crazy waiting and waiting. And, uh, man, I appreciate you coming here and being here in person to tell me this because I've always wanted this, okay, for a long time. And to have Roger here, Mr. Jones, to, to celebrate or be part of this with me, it couldn't be better. It couldn't be better. And I thank you so much. And I promise I'll live up to what the Hall of Fame is all about and all those great guys that make up the Hall of Fame. I know you will. I will live up to it the rest of my life. And now you're giving me it, a chance at immortality. The Philadelphia Eagles at the draft. No, it was just a spur of the moment type thing. You know, I, I knew what I was going to say, but I didn't plan on saying it that way. Uh, I was going to take advantage of the national TV time <laughs> and say a little more than go up there and read Chidobi Awuze, the 60th yeah. pick in the second round, especially after sitting about two and a half, three hours in the green room mm. waiting for your turn to go up there. So uh, I knew what I was going to say, but the Eagle fans, they picked on the wrong guy. You know, I, you know, it don't take much to motivate me uh, in that kind of atmosphere. And uh, they, when they started booing and uh, started talking noise, uh, actually what I tried to do to maintain my composure mm -hmm. uh, was to look for Cowboy fans in the audience. And we had a ton of fans out there. Uh, we here's, here's were you there? Favorite. Yes. Okay. It was crazy because we were in the front row. Oh, the yeah. Well, I was looking cowboys. right at you. We were screaming, how yeah. about them cowboys? And we couldn't hear what you actually said. Because you, know, you we had were too just, close, like, it was yeah. Like a mosh pit yelling and everything mm -hmm. else. And everybody kept saying, Did you hear what Drew Pearson said? And I was like, I, I yeah. know, we couldn't hear either. Yeah. And then I got back, I was like, Oh my God. And then he heard all the uh, boos and oh. it getting louder and louder. You knew something was going you on. Know, you started the whole trend down. <laughs> well, because now well, everybody's. You, you know, the thing that. is, they're trying to match that, but you got to match the atmosphere. Yeah. That's what they created do. the presentation. You know, when you have 32 teams represented like we did at AT&T for mm -hmm. the last draft, 
you know, you get out there and try to, motive, you know, get <laughs> fired up. You're only firing up 32 people, yeah, you know, right. in the audience. So it's yeah. not it was the atmosphere that that uh, uh, lent to the presentation. And so I don't know if they could ever duplicate that. But if they duplicate that, then somebody, just somebody, might be able to duplicate the greatest draft speech of all time. There you go. There you go. From, from Bill Bates, one more question for you. How does it feel to come back 13 points down with four minutes to play in the final game of the 79 season against the Washington Stinking Redskins and get the number one seed? Well, anytime uh, you beat the Redskins was very special. Uh, and the reason is because most of the time, we were playing for the NFC East title mm -hmm. and uh, right to go to the playoffs and that type of thing. We, you know, our goal always was to win, win the division title. Mm -hmm. And when George Allen came, we had a run for the title, but when George Allen came there, uh, he started uh, giving them the, what they needed to compete. And they did. And uh, then Vic, Dick Vermeil comes to Philadelphia and now he got, they got what they need. Same guys on both teams, yeah. but just different culture, different coach, mm -hmm. different leadership made a difference as far as their performance on the field. Mm -hmm. But anytime, any way we, uh, anytime we beat the Redskins, well, man. I you appreciate know. your time. Clinton Longley, Roger Staubach, Danny White. It don't matter who's throwing the ball. Just throw it to the original ADA, you and, you, you and you got time for six. <laughs> but one last question for you. When hurry you up, my at, beer okay. is getting hot. Your, your beer is getting hot. Okay, we yeah. gotta hurry this up. With the rules changed the way they are now, how many more catches man, do you think you would have had? Oh man, it's lighted up, boy. I mean, he light it up. Well, they, here they I don't know how many more catches, but here's the deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You'd probably have to come to Huntsville. You know what Huntsville is all about? The prison. Uh -huh. I'd be in jail because I would be illegal. Ooh. All right, right now. Y'all would have to come. Y'all would have to come to Huntsville to interview me, cause with these rules today and these sorry cornerbacks that can't cover, yeah, I would have been down I forty five. Y'all would have had to come see. Everybody, okay. Session with uh, Drew Pearson, class of twenty twenty one. Drew, I want to start by thanking you for all you're doing to promote uh, COVID vaccination. Uh, I don't know if everybody on this uh, on this Zoom realizes the amount of effort Drew's putting in in Texas and New Mexico and other places to uh, promote COVID vaccine, um, working with uh, a partner of the Hall of Fame, Centene. So uh, we want to thank him publicly for all that good work that he's doing. Uh, let's start. Uh, let's start right off. I'd, I'd probably be remiss if I didn't start with the man who's got more Dallas paraphernalia sitting in front of him than anybody I've ever seen. We're going to start with Mark Holmes. Uh, and then next we'll come in with uh, Jake Malik will be second. Rich, I appreciate that. Drew, it is great to see you. You know, we just saw you, of course, this past weekend. And I appreciated uh, hanging and spending time with you and Tony and Randy White and things. Um, when I think about the roller coaster ride that you went through, it reminds me of ABC's Wild World of Sports because it was, you know, the, the triumphant victory and the agony of defeat seeing when you didn't get in in front of us it was just so emotional and then seeing the joy and the surprise of it this year and seeing yeah. that reflected with all of the fans at this autograph signing show was just amazing what does it mean to you to be there now with your teammates you know with randy with roger and and tony dorsett it's an embarrassment of riches and one final part <laughs> of this right. in the hail mary play did you know you were going to win that game in that huddle? <laughs> uh, let me do that. Let me go with that one first. Okay. Yes, we felt we, we felt we still had a chance. We, know, we knew even going into that game against the Vikings, it was going to be a tough, tough chore to beat them up there. They were the best team in the conference. That's why we as a wild card team had to go up there and play them. Uh, and it was a knockdown drag out game for, throughout the game. So when they scored the touchdown late in the fourth quarter, we had about 91 yards to go to get a touchdown to win. Maybe our confidence, you know, wasn't as high, you know, at that point as it turned out to be when we got to midfield. Uh, because we were going against a veteran Minnesota Viking team. And to move the ball against their prevent defense, you know, we knew it's going to take a, a lot of execution, perfect execution in some plays on our part to make that happen. 
But uh, after we got to the 50 yard line, I caught a fourth and 22 pass to get to the mm -hmm. 50. Uh, then we started thinking maybe we got a chance. Uh, but still, you're playing the Vikings. <laughs> you know, they're tough. They're one of the best defenses. They got Paul Krause, the all time interception leader, Hall of Famer back there at safety. So uh, your confidence is there because, you know, you're competing, but you also know the reality. Uh, <laughs> so we said, let's take some shots in the end zone. And the first shot we took uh, turned out to work and it became a Hail Mary and became a Hail Mary. Now, now joining this uh, Hall of Fame that has a lot of my teammates in it, you know, that makes it even more special for me and even more special I even have to give myself a pat on the back a little bit uh, to be able to have a career that matches these guys you know that I brought the same thing they brought to the table when we played the Dallas Cowboys and as much as I counted on them uh, so I can have my success you know I feel like uh, my success helped them have their success so, yeah, I am excited about it. And each and every one of the Hall of Famers that are with, still with us, uh, Cowboy Hall of Famers, has reached out to me and said, you know, welcome to the team. A few of them said it's about time. A couple of them said the team just got better now that you're back on it. So that's pretty cool. Well, thank you very much. And it couldn't happen to a better person. And I'm glad you're not in Huntsville. Hey, hey you know that story, right? <laughs> I know that story. <laughs> All right. Thank you, man. You look good in that cowboy stuff, too. Uh, always, always. All right, right. Good to see you again. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. We'll go next to Jake, and after Jake will be James Harris. Hey, Drew. Uh, first and foremost, congratulations on uh, your induction to the Hall of Fame. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I had two questions for you, actually. So the first one, we just talked about Roger Staubach. You know, he got mentioned. You played more than half of your career with Roger. He is one of the greatest Cowboys quarterbacks, clearly, of all time. Everybody knows that. My first question is just what was it like playing with him? How did he help you develop? And just what was that experience like? Um, and then the second question was uh, Har Harold Carmichael is also being inducted this year, and I'm sure you know him very well. I'm sure you guys played and got to know each other very well throughout your many years in that Eagles-Cowboys rivalry. Um, right. You know, Just what is it like? being inducted with a guy that I'm sure you're relatively close with at least. Uh, yeah. Well, let me talk about Roger first, uh, cause he's an Eagle. I can't go with him first. So <laughs> don't tell Harold I said that though. But, but anyway, yeah. Uh, playing with Roger, it just meant the whole, the, the difference in my career. You know, I, like I said, I played with some <laughs> great players. I played for a hall of fame coach and uh, Tom Landry. Uh, so I had all this going for me. Hall of Fame organization where Tex Ram is in the Hall of Fame along with Gil Brandt. Uh, so Hall of Fame organization as well. But, you know, there's a lot of great receivers that get to play in the National Football League or have the opportunity to play. But all of them don't get the opportunity to play with a great quarterback, a Hall of Fame type quarterback. And I, I had that opportunity for 11, excuse me, for eight seasons, uh, eight with him and three with Danny White. But you know, being with Roger, we had developed a rapport together. I was his guy. In our offense, we never designated a go-to guy, you know. Our plays dictated who was that go-to guy on each and every play. But sometimes we would have to break against the norm <laughs> and to get the ball to me. So Roger would do that, but he had that confidence in me. So him having that confidence to go to me in those clutch situations gave me an opportunity to develop a reputation of coming through in those clutch situations. So it, it, it meant everything to my career, you know, being around him, even when I came to the Cowboys, working out with Roger at the Cowboy practice field, uh, uh, when I moved to Dallas, the, Gil Brandt hooked me up with an apartment uh, right next door to the Cowboy practice field. And it just so happens my balcony overlooked the Dallas Cowboy practice field parking lot. So I found out what kind of car Roger Starbuck was driving. And I would sit on that balcony and wait till Roger would pull into the driveway and park his car. And then I would get, get uh, jump up, run right over to the practice field, and we would work out together. And he couldn't figure out why I was there all the time that he was there. And so I told him my secret. And uh, so he, he felt that I had something. So he went to Gil Brandt to try to get some more money out of me, out of him. 
uh, for my signing bonus because I signed for $150. And so uh, he went to Gil Brandt to try to get me some more money because he thought I had a good chance. At that time, he didn't know nothing about me from what we only from the weeks that we spent time together. But he still vouched for me because he saw something in me. And that gave me a lot more confidence when I went to training camp to try to make that Cowboy football team. So that's just one way Roger Starbuck has impacted my career. And I am so blessed and so happy and so thankful that he is presenting me into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Thank you. And then uh, the, the second question, uh, oh. Carmichael. I know, I know, it was a lot. <laughs> no, no, Carmichael's cool, man. I, I love him. I appreciate him. Uh, he's definitely a Hall of Famer. Uh, we competed against each other, and I was just glad I was on the sideline when he was on the field, you know, doing his thing. Uh, when he had that consecutive game streak going, that was through most of my career, you know, and he was a uh, pro bowl and that type of thing. So much respect for Harold Kahn, Michael, and what he did. And when I was watching the Centennial class go in and I heard his name being called, you know, I was ha happy for him even though I knew the fact that I was, he was second team all decade and I was first team. But I, I'm happy for him because I know he's a Hall of Famer, okay? He's a Hall of Famer where he's first or second team all decade. So when he uh, got his name called, I was happy. But then I started looking to see where's my name, you know, and it, it, and it didn't come. But Harold knows, you know, when we were playing, uh, uh, Jacob, we, when we were playing, we didn't sit on the bench when we came off the field. We watch what was going on on the field. So I watched the other receivers and how they attacked our defense and, you know, some of the routes they ran and try to pick up things. Maybe you can learn something. So I watched how Carmichael do his thing. And for him to do it at that size, at that height, to run the type of routes that he ran to get open, <laughs> you know, uh, he didn't sneak through any secondaries. Let me put it like that. So uh, much props to Harold Carmichael. Mike Quick, too, by the way. Hood, hood. <laughs> Thank you very much, and congratulations again. Thank you, sir. James Harris and then Nui Scruggs. Thanks, Rich. Drew, um, you've been in the spotlight for a long, long time. We're all very familiar with a lot of your stories with the Cowboys. I'm curious to know a little bit about your days before anybody knew who you were, and if you could just share any defining moments that led you on this journey to the Hall of Fame, anything that – stands out in your youth back in New Jersey and playing with Joe Theismann? Yeah, well, you know, growing up in New Jersey, in South River, New Jersey, uh, you know, as a kid growing up, period, I just wanted to play sports. That's all I cared about. I don't even went to school so I can stay eligible to play sports. <laughs> you know, don't tell my dad that. But, uh, uh, you know, and I was in, a, in, a, in an area, a media area, a sports media area where you had to, the Jets and the Giants, you had the Knicks and the Nets, you had the Yanks and the Mets, the Islanders and the Rangers, you know, and you had Rutgers University mixed in all that. Uh, so, so I was uh, very in tune to what was going on in the world of sports. And if my mom needed to find me, she knew where to send one of my brothers or sisters. She knew to go to the, the schoolyard. That's where I would be all the time. And I would go to to that schoolyard, Lincoln School, and draw a chalk line, a chalkboard, a chalk zone on the on the uh, wall, a stripe zone on the wall with chalk, and then I would uh, walk it off enough to be a, where the pitching mound should be. And now I'm up there pitching and striking out the whole Yankee lineup. All right, next up is Roger Maris. Next up, Mickey Mantle. He goes down swinging, you know, Hector Lopez. Uh, you know, all these great uh, Yankee guys that I uh, knew and uh, uh, cherished uh, because baseball was always my favorite sport. I played more baseball as a kid growing up than, than anything. Uh, so I would go down into that schoolyard. And then at the same time, if I wasn't striking out the whole Yankee or Met lineup, I would go to that same schoolyard and just throw the ball up against the wall and catch it back and forth repetitively, all different kind of ways. And it wouldn't be a football, it'd be a little sponge ball. Because the smaller, the better, you know, because the focus with the eyes and stuff like that. And these are things you're doing as a kid. You don't know. You don't think it's training. You know, you're just having fun doing it, you know. 
So then I go to South River High School. A lot of prestige in South River High School, okay? We got a Hall of Famer already. I am not the first Hall of Famer from South River High School, believe it or not. Hall of Famer Alex Wojciechowicz, Hall of, uh, inducted in 1968, is from South River High School. He went to Fordham University, played with Vince Lombardi, one of the seven blocks of granite, and then was drafted by the Detroit Lions, number one. He was a nose tackle and a center. You know, he played both ways, you know. But he's from South River High School. So he was the one that kind of started the tradition of football at South River High School. And it carried over even to the time I got there. And when I got there, Joe Theisman or Joe Thiesman, uh, y'all know him as Joe Theisman. Back in South River is Joe Thiesman. Uh, he was there. He was playing quarterback. And I had got the opportunity to start a wide receiver and safety on defense. And with Joey, the starting quarterback, we played our first game at, at, at Denny Stadium. Uh, against Carter Rett, and uh, later in the game, I ran a post pattern, and Joey started scrambling, and he was scrambling to his left, and I just kept running, and he threw the ball, and I'm watching it come down, and I caught it in the end zone, and it turned out to be, you hear what I said? I caught it in the end zone, <laughs> and it turned out to be a 60-yard touchdown pass. My first pass I ever caught in high school was from Joe Thiesman, was a 60-yard touchdown pass, and I caught it standing in the end zone. So I would play the varsity game on Saturday afternoon, all game, offense, defense, special teams, everything. And then I would play the JV game on Monday afternoon after school at quarterback to groom to replace Joey at quarterback when he graduated. So after Joey left and went to Notre Dame, I became the starting quarterback at South River High School. And then my senior year, I was all-state quarterback and recruited the Tulsa and a number of other schools like Nebraska, Michigan State, uh, recruited as a quarterback. But uh, proud to be a uh, part of South River High School uh, football legacy, sports legacy, period. So uh, Joe Theismann was a, a big part of that as well. Thanks, Drew. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Nui, you're up, and then VJ. All right, Drew, my man. Uh, how What's long? What's up, Nui? Looking good, brother. Thank you, thank you. Right on. How long is the speech? And through the years, did you watch the Hall of Fame speeches? You know, especially so we saw a run on receivers a couple of years ago. Could, could you take, did you take yourself through it? Or did you just say, you know, I, I don't want to watch because you kind of, you know, you, you felt you were a Hall of Famer during that time. No, I didn't watch the speeches. No, sometimes I watched the beginning of them, but. Uh, you know, sometimes it got a little long winded. You know, I heard Ray Lewis went about 48 minutes. You know, I, I, I ate dinner, went to the restroom, took a shower and everything before he got done. Uh, but, uh, no, he, you know, since they're limiting us, they're limiting us to only eight minutes, you know. And so we had to turn in our first draft earlier this month. And my first draft after they saw it, they said it's too long. But, you know, Louie, you train me how to. Uh, 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 do uh, condense words and get what your point across, you know, doing the TV thing, you know, you had to do start certain things in a certain amount of time. So I knew how to, to time myself in the pace that I read would read this uh, speech, but they said it was too long. It timed out for me for seven minutes. Uh, our maximum time limit is eight minutes. And so I, I'm working to try to condense it. But I tell you this, Nui, as I was writing it, man, I started crying. Tears started coming. You know, I'm an easy cryer. You know that. <laughs> but tears started coming to my eyes. I got emotional writing my own uh, uh, induction speech, what I would hope would be emotional to people as they heard it, you know. And so uh, that's a little insight on that. But now I'm redoing it, trying to come out, uh, come up with uh, uh, what they're uh, satisfied with and go with that. Go with that. But the thing I want to emphasize in the speech for sure, Nui, is why I'm here. And that's because of the NFL and the Dallas Cowboys. And uh, I'll highlight that for sure. But I'll also highlight my family, mostly my uh, media family. So that's about all the time you have. At six minutes, you get a uh, red light. At seven, you get a yellow light. Eight minutes, you get music. You're out of here. <laughs> Drew, Drew, what would you say to other NFL players who feel that they've got that resume to be in Canton the way you were? Oh, that's a great question, Noe. I, you know, the only thing I could tell them is 
uh, continue to be patient, continue to have the faith, because that's what carried me through, patience and faith. And uh, that's all you can do. The thing about it, you can't catch any ball, more balls, get any more sacks or throw any more touchdowns or doing any more blocking for thousand yard rushers and stuff like that. You can't do it anymore. It's all there. And so uh, it's got to be good enough eventually. And that's what you hope. And so as you see other guys go in, yeah, you're disappointed. But at the same time, you have hope that gives you hope, too, because you say, well, look at if he's a Hall of Famer, then, yeah, maybe I'll get my opportunity one day. So it's about patience and faith. uh, And that's the message I would uh, leave with them uh, uh, as they continue, because this this uh, senior category, as you guys know, is really a logjam there. And there's so many great players that are deserving. Of, of Hall of Fame recognition. I'm going to mention one because he, he's not with us. Uh, Cliff Branch, for sure, should be a Hall of Famer. But anyway, uh, that's, that's another story. But anyway, it's so tough to get in, you know. Uh, uh, that's why you got to be patient and, and wait for the opportunity. Then, if you're blessed with the opportunity coming, when it comes, man, the excitement. Newey, when we got together with my class, the first ballot guys, Peyton, Johnson, and Woodson, and the others as well. But with those first ballot guys, I had to look over and see if they were happier than me, okay? You know, they weren't even no happier than I was getting in. Their first ballot, I'm 38, 38 years later, and I'm just as happy as they are. They're just as happy as I am. So that's what it's all about. Once you get in, you're in, and you're part of that team that you never can get cut from. Got me fired up, Nui. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Nui. Uh, let's go to VJ and then Chris. Hey, how you doing, Mr. Pearson? First of all, congratulations on your induction, sir, to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, sir. Thank you, VJ. Appreciate that. Yes, sir. VJ Brian Husky from Vesson Sports Network. Uh, two questions. My first question is: uh, Eight times in your career, you started fourteen or sixteen games of the, uh, of the year, so you had a great durability. Could you just talk to? about your durability in that time where you guys didn't have the technology and the training and the supplements and all the all the stuff that the players get to use today to, to keep themselves on the field. Uh, you guys were a lot tougher and it was a lot harder to do, but you were able to do it so, so through a long period of time. Could you speak to that and how you were able to pull off that trick? Yeah, uh, thanks for bringing that up, DJ, because that's very important to the process of me getting to the Hall of Fame. You know, being on the field each and every week so you can have the uh, the uh, uh, legacy behind you, catching the balls and, and, uh, and, you know, that type of thing, making plays that will one day hopefully get you into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. But, yeah, you know, my game, the way I wanted to make a mark in the game when I made the Cowboys in 73 as an undrafted free agent, you know, I didn't have all the speed in the world. I wasn't going to be that breakaway guy, that game uh, breaker, that burner on the outside. Uh, I'm not going to be that big, tough guy uh, that, you know, comes in and blocks and all that. Uh, But I said I can be that guy to go over the middle and make those tough catches. And it was something I prided myself on doing, okay? I watched NFL football when I was a kid growing up. And when I was at uh, at Tulsa, I saw how hesitant wide receivers in the NFL were to go across that middle, you know, with Erich Barnes and and uh, guys like uh, Johnny Sample and guys back in my day, those safeties that, that I played against, you know, guys like Jake Scott and uh, Jack Tatum and uh, Kenny Houston, you know, safeties like that. You go over that middle, you better have that chin strap buckled up. But that's what I wanted to make my mark. But to do that, I had to be in superior condition to take those hits uh, uh, in physical condition as well as uh, – uh, condition to uh, run, uh, uh, respiratory type conditioning as well. So uh, I prided myself on that. I pride on myself on the fact that uh, I missed three games in 11 seasons. I'm upset that I missed the three that I didn't miss. <laughs> I'm upset that Dorsett because the first, the, the second, the, the third game I missed is because I was blocking for him. He landed on my ankle and gave me that turf toe. You know, we called it a jam ankle back then. But you know. Uh, VJ, we had a, uh, a uh, trainer, our, our physical fitness guy, our trainer was a guy named Bob Ward, who just passed away, God rest his soul. But he came in with a whole different kind of 
way of training, a new plan. Back in the day when I started, everybody did the same thing. I'm lifting the same amount of weight as too tall and all this kind of stuff. Nobody had a specific plan for each player in each position. But then Bob Ward comes along and he does that. He develops that for each player. He gives each player goals to try to reach uh, in developing weightlifting and in their conditioning levels. Uh, if you not, needed to gain weight, he gave you ways to gain that weight. If you needed to lose weight, he gave you ways to lose that weight. So he kind of fit into what the Cowboys were all about, the innovation, you know, the innovation with Tex Tram in the front office with Gil Brandt, player personnel, innovation with Coach Landry and his coaching methods. So, you know, Bob Ward fit in with his innovative ways of training us. And that made a big difference. Uh, you look at Tutal Jones. I think he played 15 years. I don't think he missed the game. You know, he went through that process. Randy White, same thing. Never missed the game. I played 11 seasons with Billy Joe Dupree. Harvey Martin, they never missed the game. We all went through that same process. So that's probably a big reason why uh, we were able to survive as we did. Then the other reason is even if we were hurt, it didn't matter. We still trotting back out there. We were still trotting back out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. And, and just a, a quick follow-up. You, you, you're you, amazing at the NFL draft. You're one of the best trolls to come out there and do your thing with the Eagles. Uh, you have a lot of energy, and it pops off the screen. You ever thought about getting into television in the sports in the sports media industry? Yeah, spread that word. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> No, no, no. I've had I've had all kinds of opportunities. You know, I worked I was a weekend sportscaster in San Antonio. I worked for CBS Sports. I did eight NFL games uh, my rookie year. I was voted rookie of the year by U, uh, USA Today. Uh, and But they fired me right after that. I worked for HBO. I worked for local TV, Newey Scruggs. I worked with him for 13 years doing uh, cowboy postgame shows. Uh, uh, at the end of uh, at the uh, on on Cowboy Sunday, big game Sunday. Uh, so I've had my opportunities in that field. I'm okay. I'm good now. Okay, okay. get these right. young guys, <laughs> get these young guys that opportunity. But I appreciate you uh, uh, mentioning that. Thank you, BJ. Not All a right. problem. Thank you for answering my question, sir. Congratulations. Enjoy. Thank you. Hood, hood. Chris Daly and then uh, Skyler Dixon. Uh, hey, Drew, from one New Jersey kid to the next, congratulations on getting inducted to the Hall of Fame. And I loved when you talk about Jill Theismann because I'm a big Notre Dame fan and Theismann Heisman, as they called him. So right. you mentioned going to Tulsa and getting recruited as a quarterback and you eventually switched to a wide receiver. So can you talk about that transition, becoming a wide receiver and then going undrafted and your mentality coming into the first Cowboys camp as an undrafted guy just trying to make a mark? All right. Well, good questions as well. You guys are mid-season forums with these questions, man. I'm telling you. Anyway, yeah, I went from uh, South River, New Jersey to Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I chose Tulsa over the University of Nebraska. And they both were recruiting me as a quarterback. But my, my favorite sport growing up and all through high school, I played all three of the major sports, but my favorite sport was baseball. You know, I was all state my senior year, my junior year. I batted 444 I was a center fielder. Uh, I talk about Joey and I playing football together. We played uh, baseball together. He was the shortstop. I played second base uh, in basketball. We were the backcourt. We called him the black hole because once we passed him the ball, we never saw it again uh, unless we were getting it on a rebound. Uh, something like that. But baseball was my favorite sport. So I ended up choosing Tulsa over Nebraska because Tulsa had a great baseball program and they were going to allow me to do both. And Tulsa's baseball program was going to College World Series every year. Uh, they were uh, uh, had players getting drafted into the majors and including the great Steve Rogers. I don't know if a lot of people remember him who pitched with Montreal all-star pitcher. So uh, that enticed me more than anything else because I, as a coming out of high school, I was 5'11", 145 pounds, you know? So, you know, I didn't know if I could handle college football at that level, at that weight. But anyway, once I got to Tulsa, I, uh, I started on the freshman team at quarterback. I beat out six, uh, five other guys or six quarterbacks they brought in, uh, three of whom ended up on defense and I beat out the other three and they made me captain. I quarterback two and two season. Uh, at the end of that season, the coach comes to me and says, Drew, you got a chance to start a quarterback on the varsity next year if you make the commitment. So 
So I made the commitment, gave up baseball for football, uh, was a backup quarterback for most of the season to a senior uh, late in the season. In the final four games, I got the start. We finished, I think, two and two. Uh, but after that season, now that I committed to football, I asked the coach, Claude Gibson, uh, if uh, I could move the wide receiver because now I knew who I was going to be a pro quarterback. I just didn't have the skills to be a professional quarterback. Uh, and, but I knew I had some ability to maybe be a professional wide receiver. So my junior and senior year, they moved me. Uh, I played wide receiver. My junior year, I caught 22 passes. My senior year, I caught 33 passes. It got quite lonely out there at wide receiver. And it was a, a little shock, too, because that quarterback, you're on every play. You know, you're touching the ball on every play. Here at wide receiver, hopefully you can touch it three or four times uh, may, uh, and hopefully more a game. But you're, it's all dependent on someone else. Uh, so it's a little different out there playing wide receiver. But I knew if I was going to play football, that would be uh, my natural position. Now, going to the Cowboys at an undrafted free agent, you know, things were a lot different back then. I was one of maybe uh, 80 some free agents, you know, along with the 17 draft picks they had that year. Uh, we had a, a full two weeks of two a days uh, with Coach Landry out there in Thousand Oaks with just rookies. And he, he tried to kill us. And he, what he was trying to do was get people to quit. And he got half of those guys to quit by the end of that week. And he wanted to see who could handle it. Uh, because once the veterans come, came in, man, things started happening. Things started popping. And he wanted to see who was tough enough to take it to the next level once the veterans got there and continued to improve to hopefully make the team. Uh, but I just kept doing things, kept getting opportunities in practice, kept, kept getting opportunities in uh, exhibition games, uh, whether it returning a punt 59 yards in my first preseason game against the Rams in the Coliseum, uh, whether it's uh, coming back to, to Texas Stadium in my first game at Texas Stadium and taking a second half kickoff after Coach Landry says we need a spark as we left the locker room, I take the second half kickoff and take it 53 yards down the sideline. We take it in from, from a for a touchdown from there. I remember playing in the Astro Dome. I'm sitting on the bench for three quarters. This is the last preseason game of the year. I think I'm going to get cut because I haven't played yet. They finally put me in there. Craig Mortman calls me on wing short divide, wing post, and uh, – I ran the post and he threw a beautiful pass and I just stuck my hand out there and it hit my hand and stayed there and I brought it in. But so I just kept making plays uh, to live another day with the Cowboys. And then when it came time for the final cut, uh, I don't know if everybody knows this, but the Cowboys put me on waivers. They put me on waivers and the Chicago Bears claimed me and the Cowboys had 24 hours to reclaim me. And Chris, thank goodness, they reclaim me. Okay. Uh, and that made a difference in my career. Cause if I go to the Chicago bears, I'm probably playing with all due respect, they're pro guys, uh, Bobby Douglas or Bob Navellini or somebody like that instead of Roger Staubach and Danny white. So, uh, that's, uh, that's the story of how I got through the Cowboys. It was a rigorous training camp. Uh, we actually had six wide receivers make it that year. Uh, my, my receiver coach was his first, First year in coaching, uh, Mike Ditka, uh, who knew nothing about wide receiver position and running wide receiver routes. The blessing for me is that the Cowboys had made a trade uh, that summer to bring Otto Stowe uh, to the Cowboys, who had been playing behind Paul Warfield for a couple of years in Miami. And they traded Ron Sellers to the, uh, to the Dolphins. That's why 88 was available when I made a team and I could select the number. Uh, but Otto Stowe is the one that taught me how to run pass routes in the NFL. And he didn't tell Drew, this is how you do it, this and that. No, I got in his back pocket. I, I simulated him. He ran that out route. I ran it the same way. He ran the in route. I ran it the same way. You know why? Because he learned it from Paul Warfield. He's running the same the, the, running routes the same way Paul Warfield ran it. How do I know that? Because I studied Paul Warfield. I watched Paul Warfield run his routes. So anyway, that's how I learned the wide receiver position. Then the 10th game in my rookie year, Otto Stone and Mike Montgomery, two guys ahead of me, got hurt in consecutive weeks. I start my uh, 10th game against Philadelphia Eagles. Coach Landry throws me one pass. It's a sideline pass. I catch it for about 12 yards. 
And then we play on Thanksgiving Day against my Miami Dolphins. And now he's going to unleash me. I end up catching eight passes for 80-some yards all over the middle, all tough catches on the 84 route. And uh, then, then I started having opportunities from, from then on out. But once I got in as a starter, that was it. Uh, Otto Stowe couldn't recover from the ankle injury he had. Mike Montgomery, the same thing. Uh, so uh, once I got the job, it was mine to keep. Yeah, thank you. And I also love your work in the uh, XFL, by the way. <laughs> oh, you, you remember those days? Yeah, I yeah it's coming back, too. Those. So hopefully that can uh, hopefully hopefully the third time, third time's a charm. Well, if they do it right, they could have a good opportunity. Because I tell you, Chris, there's enough players out there to support a secondary league, you know. They don't have to be worried about matching the NFL. Just do their own thing and develop their own way. I, I think uh, over time they could become successful. Good yeah, stuff, Chris. Uh, huh? Will I see you in Canton? I'm not going to Canton. I wish I was, but uh, it was great talking to you. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Uh, yeah, running on TV. Uh, <laughs> clock's running down. It's almost time for the hail mary. Uh, we're gonna let uh, we'll let Skyler throw it, and Drew, you can catch it. All right. Hey, good stuff. I like. Yeah. Hi, Skyler. Drew, Drew, many congrats to you. Following up a little bit on Nui um, and, you know, getting in, I know, I know there was disappointment. I don't know if anger is too strong a word. I'm sure you're aware of how T.O. reacted when he got in. How did you sort of transition from disappointment or whatever other emotion there was with not getting in to getting in and then how you reacted to that? Yeah. You know, not getting in, you saw the emotion, the raw emotion. And I was so disappointed at that time because I thought, uh, Skyler, this was my opportunity. This might be my only opportunity. If I don't get here now, I'm going to be thrown back into the lump of senior candidates and maybe ever, not ever get the opportunity to come through that door and get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So I was disappointed. And the other thing, I'd never been a finalist before. So this is the first time I was a finalist. So that's why I had everybody in the world at my house. Every media, Newey and his crew were there and everybody else because uh, but I wanted everybody to be a part of it because I was sure, I was almost very confident uh, that I was going to get that call, but it didn't happen. So what you saw was raw emotion, raw, raw disappointment, raw heartbreak. And, uh, uh, but, you know, 30 minutes after that, I was okay, okay? I wasn't mad at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. How could you get mad at them, you know? I, all I wanted was hey, maybe my time will come, you know? Maybe this wasn't the right time. I believe a lot. And uh, the good Lord creates a path for me, for us. And uh, sometimes it uh, uh, doesn't all be for good, but it, it's, in the end, it's for good. And so I, I believed in that and kept my, kept my faith and was patient. But, you know, what is it? August comes and they do the uh, votes for the senior nominees. And I'm out cutting my grass. You know, it's hot as heck here in Tulsa. I'm not even thinking about the vote. I'm not even thinking about the Hall of Fame or anything. I didn't even know they were going to do the vote that day. And I got my had my cell phone in my pocket, and Rick Gosselin texted me and said, Drew, answer the phone when it rings. And so I said, okay, Rick. I always I text them back. I always answer the phone when you call. You know, I emphasize you, you know, uh, to let him know that I will answer that phone. But I'm waiting and waiting and waiting. The phone never rang. And then I go inside. I sit by the pool. And then it rings, and I think, oh, this is not 214972. This is 330 area code, Canton, Ohio. Now, I've been to Canton a few times, guys, but I never met any women in Canton. So I knew this had to be the Hall of Fame, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out, turned out to be the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and it was Mr. Baker on there telling me uh, uh, I've been nominated as the senior – only senior candidate and uh, I needed 80 percent of the vote but it's almost a guarantee that you're going to be in and so I found the way I wasn't uh didn't find out that I was in I'm around everybody when I did find out I'm around nobody and so from then on uh I got on the phone and started calling people and texting people and letting them know and uh Mr. Baker you talk to him he'll tell you how excited I was uh after receiving that news uh, but then the, the next level of excitement came when I got the final word, the final knock from Mr. Baker saying you're definitely in. So uh, that was pretty much the process. 
Drew, we thank you for your time. Uh, can't wait to see you in Canton uh, whenever it happened. And it finally did happen. And there's going to be a lot of people here wearing 88 jerseys uh, to welcome you right to Canton. On. And uh, real quick before you sign off, uh, can you confirm yes, that your bust is going to have 1970s <laughs> Afro hair? I can confirm that. Uh, one of the most asked questions other than who's going to be your presenter is that, okay? Is your bus going to have an Afro on it? And it'll definitely have an Afro. And the Afro will be 19 inches, okay? And you're wondering why 19 inches? Because that's the limit the hall will let me have, okay? They said you got to have room for, you got to have room for the other bus. So it'll be the biggest Afro in the Hall of Fame. So I have my distinction there as well. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, good stuff. Thank you, guys. Thank we'll you. I appreciate you being here and giving me the time. Thank you. Countdown Thanks. time. <laughs> Thanks, Drew. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thanks, you, Drew. Congratulations, man. Congratulations. Thank you, guys.